Okay, Kevin, are we ready? Okay, uh, this is the uh, lecture on Kology. I'm Lawrence, or I should say L.K. Samuels, that's my pen name. A lot of people know me as Lawrence, uh, but uh, I know L.K. just sounds a little bit better. Um, this is the first time I'm uh, using a PowerPoint. I have some friends who said, you gotta have, you're, you're not with it unless you have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so um, this is the first time anybody has seen this. So consider yourself almost like virgins <laughs> to be converted over to something else. <laughs> okay, um, the, the, the title is what relevance does this have? Chaology, chaos theory and complexity science, what relevance does it have to libertarians? And I pondered this question back in the 1980s when this science was revealed to me, or some discussions, that maybe chaos um, can prove scientifically that liberty works, that open-ended systems Flexible systems, evolving systems, nonlinear syst uh, uh, non systems work far better than closed-ended systems, inflexible, rigid, deterministic, linear systems. There's a whole range of that. Uh, well. um, and that's what I prove, try to prove in my book. It's over 400, it's 411 pages, and I get into a lot of topics, um, material that's never been brought together, uh, the science of chaology, you have scientists working in many different aspects of it, and really no chaologist has come together and tried to talk about economics, politics, and human action. There, it almost like it's, um, you know, some kind of poison or something. They do not want to talk to about what I call social chaology. And being in mostly government schools, if they really did study um, chaology and system theory, which I get I have a whole chapter based on system theory, and looked at command and control systems, um, they would probably say probably some very ugly things about government. And that probably wouldn't do too good looking on their resume. So I decided to go where no chaologist has gone before. Um, so let's start off. This is uh, an early book, basically, to, in the wake of, K, of chaos. Uh, uh, and it defines chaos theory as a, a quantitative study of unstable apical behavior and deterministic nonlinear dynamic systems. Don't you just love that? <laughs> it's a mouthful. But, but chaos, what it does is provide insight into understanding unstable, irregular uh, behaviors and systems. Years ago, scientists would, would do experiments, and often, you know, the scientific method is to do something over and over again to get the same results. Well, generally, when you start reading up on some of the better well-known chaologists, you find out most of the time, that doesn't happen. They don't match up every time. It's, it have to put in the fudge factor, because no system really is linear, you know, straight line, Almost every system I can think of is, is chaotic. It, it's a wave, it's up and down, things change because of sensitivity on initial condition. Too, many, too much complexity, basically. And so they have to change the numbers to make it fit. And, and this is when chaology started to come out in the 70s and 80s. They're saying, wait, there is something going on here bigger. Um, I have to get it to, into a little bit about chaos. Um, you know, chaology is really a study of order and chaos, looking for hidden order and chaos and chaos and order. It's, uh, some people complain it should have been maybe called the order theory instead of the chaos theory. This is a little more sexy, I guess. That's, maybe that's why they went with it. Um, actually, when you think about chaos, there would be, uh, nothing would exist. Universe, nothing would exist because Chaos is, it's like, the, like, like I use an example. Have you ever gone to Russia? I say to someone. They say, no. Well, the first time you go is chaos. You've never been there. But if you keep going back to Russia every year, you've created order. 
Order is nothing but repetition. You keep doing it over and over again, that's order. Pregogen, the, the, the Nobel Prize winning uh, chemist, that's his big insight in his book on, on, on chaos, is it's just a repetition. Of course, um, for some people, if you're doing something over and over again, you must like it. But then again, you have serial killers who are very orderly, and they keep doing the same thing over and over again. So, um, but chaos can be frightening, because the first time you ever go somewhere, like this hotel, first time I've been here, uh, uh, driving around this place trying to find a room, I mean, that's pretty chaotic. <laughs> now, how long that took. Um, so, uh, I've went all through that already, and uh, the repetition of patterns, get, yeah, you can read it right there. So, so, liberty, in a sense, is the ability to do things that's never been done before. Most countries, the political system, don't, they don't want to do new things. They want to keep it the same old way, which means that they are in power and you're not, and are going to do things to you that, well, you're probably not going to like. Uh, but who cares, because you really can't do anything about it. I mean, they might have elections, but they're the ones that count the, the, the ballots, so, you know, the opposition is not going to win. Why is it important? Um, I already mentioned this, open-ended system, adaptable, evolving. In fact, they have a whole chapter on evolution, the chaolog chaologist view of evolution. Uh, it is similar to Darwin, but there is some big differences. Um, yeah, the liberty works. Okay. Here's something that's important to understand. Maybe, and I'm sure Hayek understood this. I consider Hayek probably one of the first chaologists. He just didn't know it. It just wasn't around at the time. But there are two divisions of order, unstructured and structured. Unstructured order is spontaneous change from below that often leads to self-organizing syndrome of, of community and, and many other things. Um, and structure is imposed from the top going down. And that's why you get often what v von Mises mm -hmm. called planned chaos. Or sometimes um, they call it anarchy chaos. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, and it's in a book, there was a um, Pravda article back during the Soviet Union time, and they were complaining about these five-year plans. Nothing would go right. Ro uh, nothing would go right. It was just, the, the system wouldn't work, it was chaos, and I think they referred to in their article in Pravda is, is uh, either plan, I forget, either planned chaos or, or anarchy chaos that the political system was creating. Um, and so people don't understand this. They, when they, when they, when you, when you, like for example, someone tell me, there's chaos in the Middle East. Look, there may be war in Syria. And I said, well, it's kind of a political plan type chaos. You got two massive, you have governments coming together creating chaos. It's not the chaos I'm talking about. It's not the scientific mathematical chaos that people talk about. This is political systems creating, creating a, uh, 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 almost design chaos. Of course, it gets out of control a lot of times, but uh, okay. Uh, this is actually my chapter two. When, what happens when order is imposed, legislated, codified? It bifurcates, it becomes extinct, or it becomes radically, radically distorted. In nature, what I use, I talk about dynamic systems, um, and a lot of times dynamic systems are opposites. An example is like the sun. You have two dynamic systems fighting each other, gravity pushing it in. You have fusion pushing it out. Now, if the government came in and said, well, now you've got to add something else, something ecologically friendlier, it wouldn't be the sun anymore, because naturally it came together. You get an organization out there, and you, people come together to do a certain thing. Now, if an external organization comes in and says, well, you can't do that anymore. You've got to do this. You've got to charge money for membership. You can't have conventions. You can't do this. Can't. Well, the people are going to say, wait a minute. That's not how we put this together. You know, we're here for these reasons. This is how we organize it. So if a government comes in and starts to say, you've got to do this or do that, all of a sudden, either you're just going to say, hey, I'm going to quit. It goes extinct. Or it becomes something it never was. The distortion leads to bad results of unintended consequences, which, in my book, boomerang effect. 
But Burning Rain Effect is, is really more than that. It's really about system theory. And so in that chapter in the Boomerang, I talk about system failure, basically. So what happens, I mean, the question is, why do you see so much boomeranging? You can take almost any law, and I have done that, look at it, what it was going to do, look at what it does 10 years later or later, or later than that, and you don't just get a side effect often, you get the exact, exact boomerang. The example I use in my book, one of the better ones, is the uh, forced busing. Now, I assume a lot of you are old enough to know what forced busing is. Telling children to go to a certain school because you want racial equality. You want integration, not segregation. So that's been going on for 30 some years. Harvard did a report a few years back then studied it. Guess what they said? They said that the schools now are more segregated than before forced busing. The exact opposite. And there's a whole bunch of range. I think I even talk about the, uh, the um, well, anyway, there's a whole bunch of, 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 of um, boomerangs in the book, examples I use. And, but you see it everywhere, and, it, and it's fascinating. Probably 80% of the laws you look at, you'll see a boomerang. And the question is, why? And, and a lot of it has to do, and I'm getting off topic a little bit, um, Okay, chaos theory needed something more to explain chaos. And so they created complexity science or complexity theory. And this is the one that talks about self-organizing systems and it tries to explain why these things happen. So basically what's happening in these systems is that the larger they are, the more likely they are to fail because like Hayek, information. Information is not centralized. Knowledge is not centralized, if you know the, the, the famous article from, uh, from Hayek. And so the left hand doesn't know even, there, there is a right hand in the bureaucracy. You see this in big corporations too, it's not just government. Um, and so there's a whole series of problems, basically the fact that a system as they get larger, has so much complexity, nobody knows what's, what's going on. And so it's just right for having boomerang effects. And, uh, and I don't think a lot of chaologists have actually pointed this out. Um, get a little bit into unstructured orders, uh, self-organizing systems, best, uh, well, s uh, spontaneous order and creativity. Um, Adaptive systems, non-deterministic, non-linear, unpredictable, and evolutionary, and, um, and on. Um, Self-organizing systems are very interesting, um, and it does provide um, a lot of ways to show how, how, how um, uh, structures emerged from the spontaneous order and why they do what they do. Yeah, see, I got ahead of myself. Actually, complexity science and, cha and, and chaos theory, a lot of people say, oh, it started in the 1960s with weather modeling. Uh, actually, now, um, <laughs> some historians in the field, it really goes back to the early 1900s with the problem of the three-body problem. How many people here know what the three-body problem is? Okay. Uh, actually, this is a great argument to use against uh, climate either getting colder or warmer, the three-body problem. I actually have it in there using an example. I'm going to make somebody really mad, but okay. Um, Einstein tried to figure this out. Okay, you have two, if you have two heavenly bodies, you can pretty well kind of tell where, where they're going to go, the trajectory, um, where they are. But once you get to three bodies, you really can't tell. You can't do it with four, can't do it with five. You can't do it with three, you can't do it with a hundred. And this is the same thing with like swarm, swarm uh, and with uh, um, global warming, is that there's probably, un, when it comes to weather and climate, almost unlimited number of factors. In fact, here's one factor, I, 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 it came out by the time I wrote this book, that nobody knew about. They found out that methane actually is produced in live uh, plants. Nobody knew that. So here you're going out there, planting trees to get rid of CO2, 
you may be producing more methane than the CO2 is going to be absorbed from the trees. That would be a good boomerang. <laughs> um, so complexity uh, theory, or complexity science, is a really important tool to use. And it shows, again, why centralized systems don't work. They are too, um, too complex. Uh, let me see if I get it. Here it is. This is, um, yeah, important. Complex design contends that as complexity increases, so does unpredictability. The more complexity, the more unpredictability, and therefore the more uncontrollability. You can't control what you can't predict. Guess who also made that observation? Stephen, um, Stephen Hawking. He says the same thing. If you can't, if you can't measure the, the current time period we're in right now, the, the present's time, how can you predict the future? He has a nice quote, and uh, I think it's in the uh, brief uh, story of history of time. Um, should have put it in there. I'm trying to think of some other stuff on, on complexity. Um, it's a fascinating field. It's, it's for actually fairly new. Um, it's also actually, they now have a science for, um, for economics. They call it complexity science. It actually has a Wikipedia page now. I call it market chaology, but um, the economists are starting to call it complexity science. Uh, yeah, this is, again, sensi sensitivity, sensitivities to initial condition. Um, small things got big effects, meaning that mankind cannot predict the future. It can only come up with probabilities. So basically, uh, we don't know if the sun is going to come up every morning, but there's a high probability. Um, yeah, here we go. Yeah, I did put it in there. One certainly cannot predict future events exactly if one cannot even measure the present state of the universe precisely. He, he does it better than I do. Hmm. And, 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 and that's what they're doing. When you look at a 200, 300 page law coming out of Congress or any legislative uh, body, what they're saying is, uh, we know the future. And it's chisels in stone. And you're going to follow it. And if you don't, well, you're going to be fined, taxed, or in prison. If you resist, they'll shoot you. Uh, they're saying, in essence, that we know the future. And these laws cannot really evolve. Now, some people tell me, well, yes, you can go in there and try to change the law. Well, that's very rare. And then when they go in there and try to change the law, usually they make it worse. So, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it doesn't happen. I mean, <laughs> uh, in my community of Carmel, they still have a law on the books that says it's illegal to wear high heels in the city. Um, okay, actually if you follow the logic or follow the history, you find out there was some reason for it. They used to have cobblestones in Carmel. Well, there aren't any cobblestones left, but the law is still on the books. And they joke about it in the newspaper, but they won't get rid of it. In Pacific Grove, it's a street, uh, city down the way, there is a law on the books that says if you have blinds in your house, you have to allow a crack of about two inches. You can't take the blinds all the way down to the bottom. They have to be open so somebody can look through it. And it's still on the books. Why? It goes back to prohibition. They want to be able to peek into your house to see if you're drinking. Now you say to yourself, these are little laws. Come on, why don't you get rid of them? No, there's tens of thousands of these bonehead laws still on the books. They don't get rid of laws. They just let them, there. and then they tell people, oh, you have to enforce all the laws equally. I was told that by a, a government official once, and I just laughed, and, and then, the, then they got the DA on me. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously. I uh, gave out, uh, there was a, um, in my uh, town, well, my area, they want to have a city, and, uh, and my group didn't want to have a city. And they had tons and tons of money, like 300,000. And we didn't, so we got the voter registration um, uh, material to send out to our people by email. They were, they were just giving out, making copies of it, and giving to people, and walking the neighborhood saying, hey, vote for the city. And, well, we didn't have that kind of money. So apparently, that may be illegal, and so. That's why 
the DA was investigating, and I made a little crack down at the voter registration. It was just a joke. He says, you know, geez, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, all the buildings, government buildings are in Salinas, you know, where there's a lot of crime. And I said, you know, seems like it'd be better if these people were looking, you know, uh, after DA looking after, uh, you know, murders and uh, carjackings, and, and the head of the of Boulder says, they can't enforce all laws equally. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, I should put high heels on her, let her go walk down Carmel. <laughs> um, anyway, that's, that, was, that was real, that was precious. Um, system theory, I talk about, again, I talk about this chapter two. Systems repeatedly fail because they can. Monopolistic structures with the power to impose order cannot legally go out of business, meaning that poor results are rewarded with additional money and power. Uh, there is no incentive to succeed, therefore government succeeds by failing. I mentioned that to a couple of people, leftists, and they got really upset. They said, I wouldn't get involved in politics if I believed that. I'm saying, yeah, yeah it'd be great if we weren't uh, getting involved. <laughs> uh, additionally, a government, governmental bodies repeatedly fail because they attempt to predict the unpredictable and control the uncontrollable. And when this occurs, command and control Command and control systems foster planned chaos. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I've been around enough to see this. I'm actually, I hate to tell people, I almost, almost didn't come here the first year because I said uh, to Libertopia, you know, I am a, a government official. <laughs> I was elected to a citizen's committee to uh, give a report to the mayor and the city council of Seaside about eminent domain issues. And uh, now that Emma Domain, or the, um, the um, um, that's not available right now, Emma Domain, uh, redevelopment agencies are not in right now, but they'll come back. Don't, you know, don't hold your breath. Um, I'm no longer chairman of that. Um, but I, I was elected to caucus by the city. I actually have a property in Seaside, and I didn't really want to be on a committee. But I got dragged in there by my wife, <laughs> because we have property there. And so five people were running. I said, look, I really don't want a committee. I'm doing enough other stuff. I'll just go hardcore. So I went hardcore about how bad eminent domain is, and how these people are horrible and all that. Naturally, I win. <laughs> and then I said, look, I'm going to the meetings. I might as well be chair. Oh, the bureaucrats really hate it. Oh, they they'd had a tizzy. Oh my God, I think there was more bureaucrats there than actually were my 13 member committee. But anyway, I'm getting off topic here a little bit. Uh, swarm intelligence. This is a good field that libertarians should really study. Um, they provide the evidence that highly organized societies that do, do not need central authority. Um, the, uh, the bees, the ants, the termites, the queen just lays eggs. There is no central system, and yet they're very highly organized. Uh, for example, the um, termites in Zimbabwe, you know, ones with the big mounds, um, they gather uh, leaves and branches and stuff and put it down into their nest, and they live off the, the fungus that grows on it. But the trouble is the fungus can only be about 68 degrees. Well, you, if you know Zimbabwe, it's 100 during the day and could be 30 at night. So they open and close tunnels. They create a central heating, uh, cooling system, and it works. In fact, there was a building designed just on that principle to, to cool it and heat it, just as the termites did. But there's no centralized system. Um, part of what they use, besides chemicals, um, they use knowledge sharing and collective wisdom. But it's, very, it's decentralized, it's unstructured order, and, uh, and, and highly successful. Actually, did, this did not begin with animals. It started in 1989 with robots that were networked together. They gave them simple commands, they let them go out and see what they could find, and what they discovered is that dumb things can come back with, with intelligent results. Again, that shared knowledge. Now, here's one that's, that's, that's interesting about my chapter on this. Uh, I tried to apply it to humans, but, uh, but there is a problem. 
the reason the ants and bees can go out and report and bring back accurate information is because they're too dumb to lie. Now, humans think in abstract. They don't always see things as reality. Often they see things as what they want it to be. So the trouble is, the more intelligent the person, the more the tendency for you to lie. And systems do not work well if you get inaccurate information. We saw that with the Soviet Union. To have a system work well, you have to have correct information, good or bad or whatever it is. In political systems, they like to shoot the messenger. They don't want to do anything about the problem, just shoot the messenger. The messenger will go away. In fact, in the Soviet Union, one time they, uh, some economist uh, came back and was saying, well, you know, your economy is not doing too well under this socialized plan system, and um, you, know, you need to make some changes, and uh, showed that actually, instead of having growth, they're having uh, decreased growth. They, they, they were, uh, their economic activity was re being reduced. And the Soviet Union says, oh, that's interesting, and had them ship off to prison. I think they actually shot some of them. Because, <laughs> typical shoot the messenger. They were bringing back accurate information, and their system could not handle it. Because they were based more on ideology about what should be, this utopia. And when reality comes in, well, they, they can't handle it. It would, it would destroy their whole ideology. So they have to go in a different direction. But this is a, you know, a very good area to study. I have another book that I'm working on that goes a little deeper into the political ramifications of swarm intelligence. And, uh, but the problem of uh, human having abstract thoughts is a problem. Uh, but we have seen in the, in the past societies that have been based on voluntarism and have worked well. For example, Ben Franklin, I talk about that, where you know, even though he called it a public library, it wasn't a public library, it was, it was privately funded. Public back at that time, by the way, meant that anybody could go to it. So back then when they talked about public schools, they didn't mean government-run schools, they meant that the school wasn't just for some, some elite uh, students somewhere. So um, uh, Ben actually was able to get the streets um, um, uh, paved, uh, he was able to have a, a policing service that was organized by the community, uh, insurance, fire companies, all basically, pri uh, college, everything privately uh, uh, funded by the community. And it was, uh, it, it was just, it just blossomed. And, and so it does work. There are many examples of where this system, in a sense, without centralized control, even without hardly any coercion, can work. I mean, our government, our federal government for about 80 years had no direct taxes on the citizens. Jefferson promised to get rid of all federal taxes, direct federal taxes, when he became president, and he did it. And so we do know systems can work without direct federal taxes. Jefferson did it by indirect means, the uh, tariff, selling land, uh, selling stamps, and, um, but uh, it, it does work. Okay, decentralization, part of, the, part of the process here. Single point of failure, kryptonite for centralized systems. As you know, uh, I'm sure you've heard this before about the internet, a little packets of information being sent out. Half the cities could be blown up and they'll still get around. Um, um, that would be, um, and the phone, for example, wouldn't, wouldn't survive. You cut the line, it's gone. And so, with most centralized systems, another reason you have boomerang is that only one area of a complex system has to be severed or, or something happened to it, and the whole system can cascade. So um, people don't realize that. Uh, and I talk about, for example, Switzerland, and I always like to tell people that uh, there are no Swiss in Switzerland. And, and I say, what? I said there's Italians, French, German, and some Roma. Um, they actually had a confederacy for a long time, and eventually they started to argue, and there was a few little battles. And so they said, we want to change, about the 1840s. And they looked at the US Constitution and says, we like that, 
Except for one thing, we don't like the executive branch. They wanted the power to be in the cantons, truly in the cantons. Now, they call themselves a federation now, but their federation looks like nothing like ours, so I, I don't know why people call us a federation, really. But they have a president for one year in Switzerland. He's one of the seven sages. After seven years, it's possible he could be a president again. And really, all he is is chairman of the seven sages. There is really hardly any executive branch. And of course, the reason for this is that if they did have a central branch and the Germans got in, well, you know what Germans do. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry if you're a German. Okay. Uh, and so they, they believe it would have been bloody war. That's why you see all these wars in Africa, these fake countries the, the Europeans created, is because if one tribe gets into power, they're going to eliminate the other tribe or give them no benefits or treat them poorly. Um, because they're not centralized. I mean, but not because they're not decentralized, like, like Switzerland. And by the way, Switzerland now is and has been for a number of years the freest country in the world and the wealthiest per capita country in the world. And of course, you all know there's a correlation between the freest and wealthiest. And if you see both lists, they're about the same. So, um, but yeah, decentralization. Um, It's, it's an important principle, and there's a lot of history that I give. I even talk about World War II, I talk about Patton, I talk about, uh, for example, uh, Albert Spears. Who do you think about decentralization? Albert Spears. He became the war, basically, war production minister of Nazi Germany. Um, they were not producing enough uh, uh, weapons, and this is just before the planes from the Allies are coming over and bombing. So what happens? Albert Speer basically decentralizes the system because he started losing a factory there, started losing a railroad there. He decided to give the power out to the people producing it instead of having a centralized system. And because of that, even with the bombing, he was able to produce more war goods, like two or three times more than the, uh, than the pre-bombing era. And by the way, the Soviet Union started doing that too, started decentralizing their military uh, war production. Again, they were losing a lot of their factories to German uh, bombs uh, from the air. And uh, the one country, that the one country that did more centralization of military production was England, and their war production kept going down, 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 down <laughs> during, during, the, uh, during the war. So, you know, it, it's a strange example to use, but, um, but it just shows you what allowing the people at the bottom level to make more decisions than the people at the top. Um, part of the problem that uh, Albert Spears talked about, it wasn't just the decentralization. A lot of the war factories, uh, um, the government came in and kicked out the people who used to run it and put in Nazi or I should say National Socialist uh, Party members who knew nothing about war production. And he had to deal with these idiots running companies, war companies, didn't know what they're doing. And that's another reason why you had to get it down even you know, lower down on the level to production managers and other people because the idiots in these war companies weren't worth anything. And that, that was kind of interesting when I, when I read that. Control and order. I have a whole chapter on control and order. What is order? What is control? And I use examples of, of like a mother-in-law doesn't ever run, you know, good joke. Um, and I've seen this happen uh, all over the place where a person wants to, for example, be closer to the children, but they want to run their lives, their adult children's lives. And so they complain, they do this, this is not right. Of course, what happens? Well, the children, the adult children, are not going to invite her any events anymore. And so even though she is trying to have control over what they do, she turns out she has less. So often when you try to get control, you'll get less. And, and the people I know that have the most control are people who are much more open. Uh, oh yeah, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. If you want to go there, that's fine. Uh, and so control meter, meet, meets out less. And it's, I've seen it just for 
30 or 40 years. Uh, for some reason, I've always been but interested in seeing how people can get people to do things. Uh, Harry Brown, in one of his books, says basically, you know, if you want your people below you to do things, you've got to make it sound like it was their idea. And, uh, and I, I've seen that before. Uh, uh, even with my kids when they were young, you tell them to do something, they wouldn't do it. Uh, and, and, and then if they want to do something, my God, they would just go to town. Um, in fact, uh, uh, my kids, since I take them out to see gold mines and ghost towns and things, they want their own mine in our backyard. So they built a trench about 30 feet down. Uh, <laughs> my wife didn't really like that. But they put air systems in it because they're worried about gas. I mean, it was only 30 feet down, you know? Uh, they had lighting systems for it. I mean, my God, they built a rail car uh, with a little rail system, take the dirt down the hill. I mean, I could never get them to do, if I said do that, they, they just, you know, do that to me. They had kids come over at night. They had to take, like, take a number to, hey, good to they lower you in a, ba in a bucket down. You know, they had wood structures above, lower it, cranks, lowering it down, and, and, <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, let me say I was crazy allowing them to do that. The, uh, the restriction was you couldn't go uh, on the side, they go straight down. The ground was pretty hard, believe me, it was pretty hard. But I didn't want them to go, you know, they wanted a tunnel under the house. No, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, so you got to put some restrictions on it. But you know, it could cave in, destroy the house, that'd be it. Well, no more, no more reunions. Um, yeah, Cinco, yeah, okay. And I think that's it. Um, again, this is the... <laughs> I do get into greater details. This is just an overview. Um, I tried not to make it too heavy. I had one editor to do the science, one editor to so, uh, to make it um, easy to understand, and that was, they didn't always work out. Um, and so, you know, it is really for the layman, but you, you know, I mean, I really worked on it for that. Um, but it does get into some heavy material, but I think most of you here can handle that. Now, we have any questions from the audience? Go ahead. About the slime holes at all with the uh, swarm intelligence? Or have you seen that or you know? The slime molds? Yeah, there's some kind of mold. Maybe uh, the term's not right, but there's some kind of mold that uh, will grow in like a straight direction to the next like food source. So there's an awesome thing online, it's kind of YouTube or something. I think I talk about some, I think it was Volvox, and that's in the evolution. Talk about some of these strange things where some creatures are alive and dead and they and then they all of a sudden create a little digestive system. I think the Volvox are the ones where they're like a single cell a creature in, in, in pond water, and they all of a sudden come together, a hundred of them connect with, uh, with little arms, and then they can swim around faster and, and get uh, food. Um, really the cool thing about this mold though is that they, they did this little like uh, experiment or something where they put um, like food sources and they mimicked uh, all the major cities in um, Japan. Mm -hmm. and they let the slime mold do its thing. And then they put it over like a um, picture of the rail system in Japan, and it mm -hmm. was like almost like that. Wow. <laughs> well, there was uh, there was an experiment they did, and I think I put it in this book, how uh, some single cells in a petri dish was able to control the flight of an aircraft, and that was kind of interesting. Very very you know um, um, rudimentary. But uh, they were still able to make get it lift up, and you know, and, and, and um, um, there is what physicists call talk about is that matter has purpose, and you see these clusterings, you see these odd things that come together. Everything from crystals to, to galaxies coming together. It's not just all gravity, but there is uh, some kind of purpose to matter. You know, um, some of these uh, um, physicists often. Uh, We'll start really studying this deep, and uh, they don't really come up with an answer, but some do become religious. <laughs> what else do we have? Go ahead. Um, have you ever heard of the swarm intelligence in human beings, and if not, why not? In human beings. Um, 
Yeah, in, in cities and, and so forth, like the Ben Franklin, when people came together and volunteered their time, you had a big organization to improve the life, uh, the life of the people in Philadelphia. Ben made a lot of money, gave away his, all his inventions. Um, you have no idea what Ben really did. He invented the Ben Franklin stove. You have no idea how many t tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people he saved by saying, go ahead and build your own. Most people had fires in their house with the smoke coming in, biomass, basically. That smoke kills currently today in areas that don't have microwaves and gas stoves about a million people from breathing in constantly this smoke from, uh, from, from, from wood, bi biomass, basically. So he saved a tremendous amount of life. The lightning rod, look how many people he saved there. Um, he created a, 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 almost like a swarm community there of people trying to improve their city voluntarily. And, and it was just a beacon of light, uh, Philadelphia there for, for a long time. Yes? In response to your question there, I think flash mobs might be a good example of how um, technology, with technology, we can bring people, get people to come together for very instantaneous things and then... Uh, You're talking about a flash mob? Yeah. Oh, the ones uh, they do in the uh, New York train stations with uh, or orchestras? Yeah, there, there's this big example with, in a lot of uh, studies, there's something else called a cash mob, uh, where people, a bunch of people sit together and decide, well, Larry Samuels, a candy store, needs some support. So let's all meet down there at 2 o'clock Monday afternoon. And so all of us, unbeknownst to you, suddenly you've got three or 400 people coming in to buy candy from you. Yeah. The next day, they aren't there. And it just comes in place. Yeah. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things that's very interesting here, because <coughs> in terms of the decentralization, I think one of the best examples of how decentralization is very protective of our interests, because we all get those questions of, yeah, but if you didn't have a government, how would we have any kind of protection from outside forces? Well, there's one life form on the planet that has figured that out, and there's no, there's no centralization to it whatsoever. Most independent uh, kind of behavior you can imagine. Uh, and people, or not people, these are life forms that are constantly under attack by very well-financed uh, corporate and political interests. Mm -hmm. And they keep surviving, they keep it down. It's called viruses and bacteria. And uh, there's a number of interesting books. One, uh, I don't remember the title of it. Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a moment. Where different viruses and bacteria were developed. But one, one that I remember was um, when someone figured out that Chlorine is a good way of getting rid of various bacteria. Yeah. Chlorine developed yes. uh -huh. and more important than that, they were able to communicate this to other bacteria and other viruses. Yeah. And people don't yeah. know how it's done. Well, we're doing it with our instant communications now. I mean, our iPhones, our, our smartphones. We're now, in a sense, like a swarm. All of a sudden, if something goes out saying, look, uh, uh, the government's doing this or something going wrong, come down here. I mean, look what the Arab Spring has been able to do with, with the uh, smartphones. So, um, so in a sense, that's like a, a swarm, um, instant communications. One thing that a centralized authoritarian government cannot stand is information that they cannot control. And um, I have a section on information theory and tells you roughly what how that how that operates. As Hillary says we need a gatekeeper for the internet. Not everyone should be able to put out on the internet whatever they want. We need someone to control it. I wonder who she has in mind. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Bill. <laughs> okay, well I better go because we have another one. Thanks for coming. All right, book.